السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آئی ایم فاروق عبد اللہ ود ہسٹری آف انگلش لٹریچر ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس ان آر پریویس لیکچر وی ڈسکسڈ لٹریری کیریکٹرسٹکس آف کلاسیکل ایج اینڈ اف آئی ایم ٹو سم آف دا لٹریری کیریکٹرسٹکس آف کلاسیکل ایج دیٹ وی ڈسکسڈ ان آر پریویس ویڈیو لیکچر دیز آر ریئلزم پریسائزنس کریکٹنس اسٹریس اوور ریزن اسٹریس اوور لاجک اسٹریس اوور ایکسپیرمنٹیشن اسٹریس اوور آبزرویشن rejection of emotion rejection of imagination and rejection of feelings these were some of the important literary characteristics of classical age that we discussed in our previous video lecture and today we are going to talk about literary figures of classical age and their prominent works as usual we are going to start from poetry dear students as i have told you that this was the age of reason so classical poetry lacks the spirit of emotion in it there is no place of emotion there is no place of imagination in classical poetry and classical poets didn't like the poets of heart by poets of heart i mean chaucer i mean shakespeare so the poets of classical age they didn't like those poets because they they spoke their heart in their poetry and the poets of classical age they were concerned with reason they were concerned with intellectual thought they were concerned with logical thought that's why they didn't care about emotion that's why they didn't care about passion so when there is no emotion and no passion in the poetry so you can you can have an idea that this is a dry sort of poetry this is the poetry that deals with urban life this is the poetry that deals with civilized world so in classical poetry there is no you know description of landscape there is no description of pastoral fields there is no description of farmers there is no description of nature there is no description of peasants there is no description of shepherds as we see in the poetry of edmund spenser and these poets classical poets didn't like edmund spenser as well so you can have a very good idea of this poetry the poetry of you know classical age that it was a sort of dry poetry and uh, if we talk about the poets of uh, classical age alexander pope holds the most dominant and prominent place in the poetry of classical age alexander pope is called prince of classicism as far as his personal life is concerned let me tell you that he was a physically deformed person he had a very low stature a very low build he had and he was an ugly sort of person and above all he was a catholic and in that time there were certain restrictions and several limitations on catholics so all these circumstances had made life for alexander pope like like a long disease so let me tell you that despite the, these circumstances despite the these adverse circumstances the kind of work that he has produced this work has has left a permanent mark on the face of english literature dear students just 23 years old he was just 23 years old when when he wrote his essay on criticism which earned him a lot of fame a lot of repute and he enjoyed that fame and that repute till the last breath of his life i mean that till death he enjoyed that repute and that fame that he that he earned when he was just 23 years old when he published his essay on criticism masterpiece of Alex alexander pope is rape of the lock rape of the lock is a mock epic what is mock epic first you must know that what is an epic you have read paradise last paradise last was an epic first know that what's an epic then you will uh, learn that what is mock epic epic is a long narrative poem that deals with with the great and lofty idea in a grand style and mock epic is a poem that deals with an ordinary idea that deals with ordinary character but in a grand style in the style of an epic so this this poem rape of the lock actually deals with an ordinary event of stealth that 
Alexander Pope presents in in the manner of an epic. So that's why this this poem Rape of the Lark is called a mock epic. So this is his masterpiece. When he translated Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, uh, he earned a lot of reputation in England and a lot of people, his contemporaries actually got jealous of out of him. So he write Dunciad. In Dunciad, he actually ridicules and he makes fun of his contemporaries. Uh, after uh, the death of Alexander Pope and in 19th century, Alexander Pope was attacked uh, by several poets and writers in 19th and in 18th century that uh, the kind of poetry that he has written that cannot be called as poetry but in modern times he had uh, he has actually regained his reputation as a great poet during his time uh, minor poets was uh, were john gay matthew prayer and edward jung these were minor poets uh, during uh, his time you can say that these were his contemporaries as well and if we talk about the prose of classical age the prose of classical age is famous for for the style jonathan swift holds the most prominent place in the style of classical age and it won't be out of place to say that jonathan swift is the greatest stylist in the entire history of english literature he was a pessimist as well pessimist is a person who looks at the dark and the bleak and the black aspect of the life a person who always looks at the negative aspects of the life he is called a pessimist uh, jonathan swift is also called a misanthrope misanthrope is a person who hates human beings who hates mankind philanthrope is a person who loves human beings and misanthrope is a person who hates human beings why is he uh, called misanthrope because of his uh, staunch style on human beings that he actually particularly that he made in his book gulliver travels his famous books are gulliver travels tale of top battle of books tale of top and uh, uh, you know gulliver travels both are written in the form of allegory but uh, that gulliver travels is also taken as a, a children book as well uh, in 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 uh, in Gulliver Travels, he ridicules and he makes fun of the political and social absurdities of that time and the kind of language that he uses. If you yourself read that language, if you yourself read those words that Jonathan Swift uses for human beings, for men of that age, you yourself will feel sordid that you will feel sordid being a human. Like the words that he uses, I cannot conclude but the bulk of your natives to be the most pernicious race of little odious vermin that nature has suffered to crawl upon the surface of the earth when you read these sort, sort of words that which are used for human beings which are used for men by jonathan swift you also start saying jonathan swift that he was a misanthrope after all he has a great place in english literature and apart from jonathan swift the other two major members in the prose of classical uh, classical age are Addison and Steele. Addison and Richard Steele both wrote essays in collaboration. Now these both were very decent, uh, you know, writers. Their writing style is graceful. Their writing style is quite decent, and they they are said to be the teachers of their age. They are said to be the reformers of their age. They were actually, you know, serving and working as a bridge between the two extremes of the society. So they are truly, they are called as a reformer of their age and both worked in collaboration and they wrote essays. So that's uh, all about the prose and uh, prose writers of the first part of classical age. And now if we talk about the later part, the later period of classical age, that is, uh, that is also called the age of uh, Johnson. 
Dr. Johnson died in 1784. You know that Johnson is the most prominent literary figure in, in the later period of uh, classical age. He is the most dominant literary figure. That's why this name, this age is also called the age of Dr. Johnson. But as I have told you people, that, uh, that uh, cracks had started appearing in, uh, in, in uh, later part of classical age. And after the death of uh, Johnson in 1784, uh, uh, classicism started giving place to romanticism. And when William Wordsworth and Estee Coleridge, Coleridge published their lyrical ballads, in 1798 that was the end of classical age and uh, still during uh, during the time of even uh, dr johnson there were some of the poets who are called precursors to romanticism they had inclination to romanticism uh, and amongst uh, those uh, poems uh, those those poets there are uh, robert burns william collins william black William Cooper, Thomas Gray, George Grable. And if, if I am to sum up the theme of all these poets in one sentence, I will speak a verse of Robert Burns. This, this verse, this couplet of Robert Burns actually speaks all about all these poets. Give me a spark of nature's fire. Give me a spark of nature's fire. That's all the learning I desire. Nature. So nature, you just keep in mind this word nature. We'll study in our next age, romantic age. William Wordsworth, you have already studied in your 9th, 10th, 1st year, 2nd year classes. And you have heard that William Wordsworth was poet of nature. So, so the romantic spirit had started appearing in the later period of classical age. That's why this age is also called the age of transition. And if we talk about the prose of uh, later period of uh, classical age, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Johnson has a great place and his work uh, that I have already, I think that talked in front of you people about that work, the lives of the most eminent English poets. These are actually biographies of English poets. Uh, critical biographies of English poet and the poets and the other major contribution of Dr. Johnson toward English literature is that he was the man who constructed first dictionary of English language. And another person who assisted and who helped Dr. Johnson. And another person who helped Dr. Johnson to uphold, to uplift the ideals of classicism was Brooke. Brooke was a parliamentarian. He had been a member of parliament for 30 years. So he, he was a thinker. He was a philosopher. He was, he was a splendid orator as well. And he was a prose writer as well. So honestly speaking, Dr. Johnson was the only person who along with Brooke upheld the ideals of classicism in the later part of classical age. Towards the end, we'll talk about uh, origin and development of novel in English literature. That is the rise of novel in English literature. And this is an important question according to examination point of view as well. That write a note on rise of novel or origin and development of English novel in 18th century. I had uh, discussed a book, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan with you and in in, in uh, when i was discussing that book i told you that that book was a foundation stone of english novel that was in the form of allegory and no writer no single novelist no single writer can be given a credit that he is the originator of novel in english literature daniel dafu is the originator of novel in English literature or John Bunyan is the originator of English novel or, or Richardson is the originator of English novel or Henry Fielding is the originator of English novel. No, a single novelist cannot be given this credit because several novelists, several literary figures have contributed for the origin and development of novel. 
John Bunyan, we have already talked about. Now, in 18th century, in classical age, there was a person, his name was Daniel Dafu. He was a journalist and he wrote uh, the biographies of the people who just died, the imminent and prominent people who just died and some of his bi biographies are about the criminals as well. When he turned to the age of 17, uh, when he was 70 years old, at that time he wrote a novel and that novel was Robinson Crusoe. So that was the first novel which was written in English literature according to the structure and according to the technique and according to the definition of novel. Although that novel Robinson Crusoe cannot be you know categorized and it cannot be put into the category of novel in, in, in the modern sense but that was that was the first you know step towards uh, towards writing a novel and towards the development of novel. So after Daniel Dafoe, Richardson, Richardson wrote a novel Pamela are virtue rewarded. This novel is about a young girl who is a sentimental, who is a chaste, has a lot of qualities of hidden art and this novel ends on a happy marriage. So this Pamela was a landmark in the history of English novel. So after Richardson, Henry Fielding wrote a novel, Joseph Andrew. So this Joseph Andrew was actually the parody of Pamela. The hero Joseph is a, a supposed brother of Pamela. Pam, in Pamela, virtue was rewarded, but here virtue is not rewarded. This is actually the parody. He is, uh, you know, uh, Joseph Andrew is not rewarded for his virtues. Rather, he is, uh, you know, dismissed from his job as well. So Joseph Andrew is an other landmark in English novel. So Joseph Andrews is said to be the first English novel according to the modern sense if we talk about according to the modern sense of novel Joseph Andrews is said to be the first English novel according to modern sense. Uh, Henry Fielding uh, has uh, this uh, you know contribution towards English literature that he put English novel on a strong footing. So this is his uh, major contribution and uh, from now we are going to end this topic right over here because it will be quite difficult for me to upload it on YouTube. I do expect from you people that you people are learning it and that's all here for now with this topic and uh, stay happy, stay blessed. Thank you very much.